I guess I'll start by saying that uh, I come from good Pennsylvania Dutch German stock. Um, on my dad's side, uh, his father was a tenant farmer. He just worked farms for landowners uh, during the Depression, and they were pretty poor. And um, my dad was one of eight, and he was the only one that went on to get a college degree. They lived um, in Springtown outside of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and he ended up going to Moravian College there in Bethlehem and uh, was pulled out of, right after college, went to work for Bethlehem Steel and then went to uh, Cornell for uh, Officers Candidate School to become a naval officer and joined in the war effort. Eventually was assigned to the Missouri. Uh, on my, my mom's side, they lived right in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and uh, my grandfather was a steel worker. He was a Bethlehem Steel steel worker, and that's what their life revolved around, uh, the steel mill there in Bethlehem. And my grandmother was a seamstress, and so she did sewing for one of the clothing stores uh, in downtown Bethlehem. Um, so with eight brothers and sisters, or seven brothers and sisters on one side, and, um, and two other children on my mom's side, had a lot of cousins. And, uh, grew up with uh, cousins on both sides of the family. Um, my dad being in the Navy, we did a lot of moving. We moved um, every two years at least, and sometimes more often than that. And We were um, up in Portsmouth for a while, we were in Monterey, wherever there was a naval base, Pensacola, Florida, Norfolk, Virginia, Philadelphia, Naval Shipyard there, all over the place. Um, what I can remember is, is Norfolk. Um, I finally uh, was in school age at that point. And uh, my father was on a destroyer at that time. And uh, he'd be gone out to sea for months at a time. And my mom kind of raised my brother and I on her own a lot because he was gone so much. But I can remember when the ship came in, all the families, the wives, the children, would be there on the dock waiting for the uh, men to come back home. And uh, I can remember one time they had done a tour over in Europe and he brought back all of these German toys, the most amazing wind-up toys, no batteries. You just wind it up and the crane would work or the car would work. It was like Christmas when uh, he would come home after being away for a while. But from Norfolk, um, we moved up into Bel Air and by some stroke of luck, my father was assigned as a liaison officer uh, at Aberdeen and Edgewood. And so they left him there for a long, long time. And he actually retired from the Navy uh, in a ceremony over at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground. And he took a job at, in retirement at Bethlehem Steel as a metallurgical service engineer. So he went back to work at Bethlehem, Bethlehem Steel. So Bel Air from second grade on was my home, and it, it's really the only home that I have any real connection with. But it was great being able to grow up in a community and, and stay in a community even till this day. Um, it's a good thing to have those roots. As long as you treated people well along the way and you didn't make a whole lot of lifelong enemies, you were in pretty good shape being in a hometown. So, um, grew up in Bel Air, in, in Howard Park, which was the only development, housing project uh, in Harford County at that time. 
and the mall was a racetrack and fairgrounds and um, Bel Air had a couple grocery stores, um, a theater. The farmers would come in on the week on Saturdays to do their shopping. It was a, a real farm community and a very close knit community and it was a very good time to grow up in Bel Air because it was very safe. We would leave the house in the morning and probably have lunch at some friend's house or our house if it was our turn to feed everybody and uh, we didn't come home until it was dark. And uh, we would ride our bikes up to Rock State Park and climb the rocks and swim in the creek or go over to Johnson's Mill on Winter's Run and swim in uh, Winter's Run. Um, we'd bike over to Aberdeen. You know, we just went and did everything we wanted to do as kids. And um, it was really kind of a, a tight-knit community. Uh, we knew the adults in the community. They knew us as kids. And um, I was very fortunate to have good neighborhood friends and, and good, good school friends who have lasted really for a lifetime. I'm still in touch with a lot of those uh, old Bel Air High School uh, friends online. And uh, we lived in Howard Park and had access to our own private country club because up the hill from Howard Park, that originally was all property of the Kelly family. Um, and the Kelly uh, great-grandfather was one of the founding doctors of Johns Hopkins. And so Lyra Dendron was the Kelly home. That's where the family lived. And um, it's now a county park and a major historical attraction. It's a beautiful uh, mansion up there. But that's where we played. They had a barn there and had horses. Um, the Gray Beals, who ran Cortland Hardware along with the Borman family, lived in the uh, winter house, the brick house down the hill. Uh, it's too hard to heat the mansion in the winter, and so they had a, a winter house, a smaller home. The Gray Beals lived there. They built a clay tennis court, one of only two in Bel Air. Borman's had the other one. We had a tennis court, we had the Kelly swimming pool, and we had the mansion to run around in. And the whole Kelly's Woods, uh, the Ma and Pa tra Trail goes through this Kelly's Woods. We camped back in there, we hunted, we fished back in there, we played pond hockey out on Kelly's Pond. Um, it was just a perfect, perfect childhood. We were very, very fortunate. Uh, with good friends and um, just a, a very close-knit community which gave us benefits that I don't think many children get in their youth. Um, when we were kids we'd walk into Bel Air, go to the Bel Air Bakery, buy a donut for a nickel and for a quarter we could go into the Bel Air Theater on a Saturday afternoon and watch Three Stooges movie or whatever was on. Um, you know, we just had the run of the place. You know, I had an older brother, Grant, who was um, two years older than me, and it was just the two boys. And when my dad was out to sea, um, my mom was, was left to kind of take care of us. And I'm sure we were a handful. And uh, I can I can remember. Uh, you knew when you had crossed the line. When my mom threatened to get the hairbrush, and if if she nailed you with the hairbrush, um, you stopped whatever uh, nonsense you were up to. Um, 
but as, as I mentioned earlier, I was very fortunate to have very good friends, close friends, growing up elementary, middle school, and high school in Bel Air. And uh, we, we did our, our share of mischief. Um, and, you know, we were good kids. You know, Amos uh, Woodward was the son of a, a biologist over at APG, and his mother was a renowned artist in the community. And Stephen Getz, his father was the um, town optometrist, and uh, all his brothers and uh, cousins were. Uh, Dr. Getz's brothers and cousins were all lawyers and prominent men in the community. Um, the Reed family, again, a lawyer's family, Mike Reed and David Reed, all in that Howard Park neighborhood. Um, but we found ways of, of getting into trouble. I, I can remember at, in Halloween, um, since Howard Park was the only development in the county, when Halloween came by, the houses were very close together. So if you wanted to get a lot of candy, you came to Howard Park. And we resented that. These people from all over Harford County would descend on uh, Howard Park and literally cars in a line, slowly moving with their kids up and down each road in Howard Park getting candy uh, from this neighborhood. So as we got a little older, we became vigilantes and we were going to put a stop to these outsiders coming into our neighborhood. So we armed ourselves with eggs and tomatoes and um, water balloons. And when the cars started rolling in, <laughs> we started nailing these um, intruders into our neighborhood. Well, we hit one carload up by Dr. Guess's house. And this wasn't a family. This was a bunch of rowdies from parts unknown in Harford County who were just looking for trouble. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we supplied the trouble. And so we nailed them with all the ammo and the doors fly open and these big guys older than us come flying out of this vehicle and we just took off running out of Dr. Getz's yard over towards the reeds where there was some woods and some open fields back up near their house. Well, all the guys are running but um, I was a little quicker thinking because it was dark. You, you couldn't see much. The Getzes had a double line of, of uh, pine trees. And instead of running, I scooted into the pine trees, curled around the base of one of those pine trees, and watched everybody run right on by me. <laughs> and I'm laying there thinking, okay, when is it safe to come out? And as I'm laying there, I'm hearing guys screaming over here, and there's yelling over here, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're killing all my buddies. Um, but I, I was safe. But I stayed under that tree for a long, long time. And I stayed long enough to where the intruders walked back, they got into their car, and they left. And I was able to see all that. And as I, I made sure I watched them drive out of the neighborhood, and then I, I finally came out from underneath the tree. Nobody got hurt. I don't know if anybody got caught or not and got roughed up a little bit, but um, that was one episode that I survived unscathed. Um, we did a lot of camping out in Kelly's Woods. And uh, camp, uh, this was in, in high school primarily, when we were a little older. And uh, camping out was just an excuse 
not to go home and to get into some mischief. So, um, this one time we got the bright idea, and this was before streaking had been invented, um, that we were, we were going to get buck naked except for our tennis shoes, and we were going to go from one side of the town of Bel Air across Main Street to the other side of Bel Air. We were going to go from Howard Park over to the Bel Air Library, which had us go next to the police station and across Main Street. And um, so there we go, nothing but tennis shoes, going from dark spot to dark spot. We eventually get over to Bond Street, which is the first main road. And there's a little alley between, right by the fire department, there's a little alley between the Methodist Church and the Western Auto Store there. So we snuck down that alley. Now it's late at night and things are all shut down. There's nobody around really. It's, I don't know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Not many people around after 9 o'clock in Bel Air in those days. But So we look up and down Main Street and there was an alley between the theater, the Bel Air Theater and Richardson's Drug Store. And so it's just a narrow alley. And we figured if we can get through there, we can get over to the library. So I can remember hiding out in that alley, watching these guys, bright street lights, bright lights running straight across Main Street into the next alley. And I, I was laughing so hard, I, I was in tears. It was hilarious. So we made it over to the library, and we made it back, and we never got caught, nobody got hurt, and we really had a, an adventure, that was for sure. I haven't laughed so hard watching those guys <laughs> running around town naked. Another time, it got really, really foggy. It was so foggy, you could hardly see. And, Betsy Kelly was with us, and Jane O'Leary, and um, I don't know, there may have been some of the other girls with us, but Amos and Steve, they, they were always with me whenever I did anything. Um, but we got the idea that we were going to toilet paper the road. So we went on to Gordon Street, and it's, it's foggy, it's misty, but it was good because it got the toilet paper wet enough to where it would cling. And so we found the lowest wire we could across the road there and we just started over and over and over. And we went from the wire all the way down to the ground. And we were lucky. No cars came by while we were doing this and we got that road completely blocked off with a wall of toilet paper. And then we just went into the bushes on the side there along a little alley and just waited. The first car came and they stopped and they backed up and went a different way. And then the second car came and they stopped and they backed up. They didn't go through it. And then the next thing we hear is the sirens. And we're thinking, this is awesome. We got the police on this one now. This is great. We just stayed there, hiding in the bushes, because you, if you flashed a light, and they had those big spotlights, it just, the mist just reflected the light right back in, and you couldn't see anything. So we're just hiding in the bushes, in the fog, and the police, so they've got their lights, and they're flashing their searchlights all over the place, they can't see anything. But they figured out, they got their billy clubs out, and they figured out it was a toilet paper wall. And so... They got something a little longer out of their vehicle and they tore down all the toilet paper so that the cars could get through. They, uh, they never searched the bushes. They never looked for anybody. They just cleared the toilet paper about 10 feet up and they took off. And uh, we all left. The fun was over. <laughs> we got the police. Uh, what more could you ask for? 
Um, we had a, a teen center in Bel Air, and um, I was very active in that. Um, I served as president of the teen center. And we, we would hold dances over the summer pretty much every weekend. Live bands, the local garage bands. Um, it was a lot of fun. But uh, after one of the teen center dancers, this was in the summer, um, my brother had his own car. He had a red Mustang. Awesome car. And I had the family car. So we got the bright idea that we were going to play car tag. You try and hit the other car with your lights. And if you touch them with your lights, then they're it and they have to chase after you. So, again, it's late. The town's pretty much dead. Um, but um, we're playing car tag. And my brother was a little crazier than I was. And at the base of, in the middle of Howard Park is uh, Thomas Avenue. And there was a little park there, Plum Tree Park. And there were no curbs in those days. So I'm almost on my brother's Mustang. And he cuts through Plum Tree Park, across the grass, cutting through the park to Bolton Street, which is on the other side of the park. And I got the family car. I'm thinking, I can't take Dad's car through that park. It's going to get stuck. It's going to have mud everywhere. So I quick turn around. I saw him going back towards town on Bolton. So I got on Thomas, and I got to where Pepe Simmons was, the old uh, butcher, German butcher shop in Bel Air. And I could see my brother, and I ran the stoplight, or the stop sign. There were no cars on the road. We were the only people around. And uh, so I, I ran the stop sign there to catch my brother. And sure enough, there go the lights, the town police. So I thought, oh, I ran a stoplight. I'm speeding. <laughs> my dad is not going to be happy about this one. So the officer comes up and... Uh, I roll down the window, and it's one of the officers that was